denk schon wieder. Okay. Oh, you're next event. Okay, then I will move to the side. Okay, to make space. <lacht> ja, aber haben Sie noch eine übrig für mich? Ja, ich wollte gerade sagen. Darf ich sogar beide nehmen? Ja, klar, gerne. Ja, super, gerne. Okay, dann kann ich die heute ja, bestimmt, noch weitergeben. Wir kannten uns bis jetzt ja, leider, nicht. Wir sollten genau. das aber ändern. Ja, das finde ich auch. Also, ich finde es sehr schön, dass das Projekt uns auch für alle vielleicht. Ja. Maybe I should sit somewhere in the middle. Take this one and then two here and two there. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay, fine. No, I, I, I don't think that anybody has any specific idea, so feel free to choose whatever. Okay, <laughs> Do we know when we should start? I mean, should we start? Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Niklas Forgo. I am the chair of this session. We have one hour to debate a very, very legally challenging, but also technically challenging topic with four highly distinguished speakers. I will therefore reduce my uh, presentation at the beginning to the absolute minimum just to orientate you about the order of appearance and then leave the floor uh, to the four speakers. There's one rule here, which is that this is to be a very, very common experience and exercise, which means that you are kindly invited to intervene whenever you want to do so. If you want to do so, please kindly give me a sign so that I can give you the floor. There are microphones all over in the room. Uh, it would be very polite of you if you briefly mentioned from where you come before you start to intervene. So the four speakers today in the order of appearance, which is not the alphabetical order, will be Alexandra Jour schroeder right from my side here. She is the deputy director general from the DG Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. As at least the lawyers in the room certainly know, there has been quite some debate within Europe uh, on the topic uh, in the last years, uh, in particular because of a proposal of a regulation that is still in the making, and she will certainly give us an, an, an insight on what Europe is doing at the moment. Then we go to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, Professor Jennifer Dascal, who is Associate Professor of Law at uh, American University in Washington, uh, at the College of Law there and at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She will give us a perspective in particular on the U.S. Cloud Act and in how far the U.S. Cloud Act has an impact on the debate um, as it's ongoing in, ongoing in Europe. Then we go back to Europe, uh, Ulrich Kelber, the Germans in the room are certainly very familiar with the name because he is at the moment the German Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. So he, is, he represents the German authority 
uh, in the field of data protection and will certainly speak about the role of data protection authorities from a European point of view, not only from a German point of view, um, um, on, on, on the subject. And then finally, Sofia Jaramillo Otoya, so, sorry if I pronounce any of the names wrongly, I'm very sorry for this. She's legal advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Digital Rights, um, and therefore will have the opportunity to wrap up what we are doing here on a more fundamental, fundamental rights point of view. That's the plan. As I said, please feel free to change the plan if you think that this is necessary whenever appropriate. Um, Alexandra, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. Maybe I should start to congratulate you that you have chosen to be with us uh, in the morning at this very important conference. Uh, we are discussing today a very topical, a very important subject, but I also have to confess it is a very complex one. Uh, it is a fascination for lawyers, but sometimes it can be a little bit hard, but I think we all try to make the subject today as interesting as possible. We may not always have the same views, but I think this is, has been done intentionally that uh, the organizers have put us together to show what are the different ideas, what are the different challenges. Um, and again, thank you very much that I have the opportunity to kick uh, off uh, this discussion today and perhaps you allow me to uh, guide you a little bit in the subject. Uh, why are we here? What is our, our big uh, challenge? Uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, I'm dealing a lot in the European Commission uh, with the cooperation in criminal matters. As we all know, most of the crimes that are committed today, today do not know uh, borders. I'm not speaking about petty street crime, but I'm speaking about uh, big uh, um, challenges we have in fighting terrorism, in fighting organized crime, money laundering, financial crime, but often also crimes that are committed uh, via uh, using uh, uh, IT tools uh, when it also comes to financial crime, but there can also be very nasty crimes as exploitation of children and, and other things. Uh, as we all know, we are living today in a, in a world that is uh, very much digitalized, uh, which the logical consequence that also the, the way how crimes are committed often takes place by uh, using electronic means. Uh, what does it mean uh, for uh, those who will have to uh, fight and go after these crimes, that also the evidence that is in the end needed uh, to bring perpetrators to court uh, is often uh, not available anymore physically, uh, possibly the only one in the rooms who still has a paper file, uh, but it's, uh, it's often only uh, available in uh, electronic format. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the biggest challenge we have, uh, the information, the data that is necessary in a criminal investigation uh, is often not uh, in the same country where the crime has been uh, committed or the perpetrator uh, has uh, his or her residence, uh, but it is uh, somewhere else. Uh, and this is, does not even mean in the country, let's say, when we speak about the European Union, that it's, for example, no longer in Germany, but in, in Ireland. Uh, but often uh, the data uh, is stored at a place in a third country. Uh, and of course, uh, it is often the case that the data uh, finds itself in the United States. But we are maybe speaking about a purely national case. The victim is German, the perpetrator is German. Emails have been exchanged to uh, prepare, let's say, a terrorist attack uh, at the Christmas market in Berlin, uh, but the data finds itself somewhere in the United States, but normally the United States are not affected. There are no U.S. citizens involved, so the interest of the U.S. is, is rather small in this case. Uh, normally, uh, and this is what has been done so far, uh, to get uh, the evidence for uh, criminal proceedings, uh, um, the prosecutors would have to start a mutual legal assistance request. Uh, this is possible, but it is uh, quite a lengthy and cumbersome procedures involving a number of authorities. These instruments have been invented at a time when it was really not uh, the, the rule, but the exception that you need to ask a third country to help you in a criminal investigation. Um, in Europe, uh, we have in the recent years 
uh, created some instruments, and one is called the European Investigation Order, uh, that have a little bit more swifter proceedings uh, between European authorities. But still here, a normal investigation can easily still take more than 100 uh, days, or even longer, depending on the complexity and where the data is located. And often, and this is our big challenge, the data is no longer available because, as you know, data cannot be stored, and we have no problem with that uh, for an indefinite uh, basis. So we have to think about uh, a mechanism that can be uh, used in a swifter way, and this is uh, by the European Commission. Um, it's now more or less two years ago. Uh, has made, I must say, a quite courageous proposal mm -hmm. to change somehow the way how uh, this evidence can be gathered in criminal proceedings by making a proposal what we call a, a European uh, protection order. To cut it very simple, the idea would be that in one state where a criminal investigation takes place and the evidence is needed, there would be a, an order that in most cases, when it comes to very sensitive data, would have been validated by a judicial authority. And this order to get the data would not go to another uh, public authority but it would be sent directly to a service provider that uh, holds uh, the data with a request to uh, provide uh, this kind of uh, data to the authority in the issuing uh, member state. And uh, of course, this is a very uh, novel uh, idea. This would be done directly, normally without the involvement uh, of the authority of the country where the service provider uh, is doing business. Why could, uh, could this be done? Why where th comes this obligation from service providers to give this information? Mm -hmm. uh, this EU regulation would be a legal basis, but of course it would also be linked to the fact that a service provider would provide services at the EU level. The idea is to say, okay, if you do business in one jurisdiction in the world, you also have to adhere to the rules in this uh, jurisdiction. This is uh, really, in essence, the idea of uh, the regulation with the objective uh, to make uh, criminal investigations more effective. Of course, and I want to say this uh, from the start, uh, this um, procedure cannot simply be done for the sake of effectiveness, but it's at the same time important that uh, with this new approach, um, the safeguards of those who are under suspicion and of course in a rather vulnerable situation have to be fully respected and we also have to make sure that the processing of data uh, is done in full accordance with our European uh, data protection uh, uh, rules. Um, there, of course, uh, we are now in a discussion uh, and that will start quite intensely from the beginning of next year. Uh, with the EU member states, uh, but also with the European Parliament, how can we in the end design uh, such an instrument that uh, brings the right balance between a more effective uh, criminal proceedings uh, in a situation where the data is no longer found in the cupboards, in the offices of those who are suspects, um, but somewhere uh, in other regions of the world. Uh, but how can we do this at the same time um, in order and to, to uh, preserve uh, fundamental rights and uh, data protection. Uh, to put another uh, element to this uh, complexity is the fact uh, about the role of the service provider in all this, uh, because the service provider, let's say the regulation becomes the law, will have an obligation to give uh, the kind of uh, data, and if the service provider would not provide the data, uh, in extreme cases, there could also be uh, sanctions or fines against the service provider. What if the service provider in the jurisdiction, uh, the company uh, is, uh, is situated in, forbids uh, to give over the data? This is a classic situation of pest and cholera, one could say. Uh, to, uh, and this is what uh, is called the title, uh, clashes of jurisdiction, the clashes of codes. So for the legislator, for us, it is now uh, important and necessary to find a way out how to prevent that there is a conflict of law, especially for the service provider, but still also for those who want to get the data. How do you find the balance uh, between the necessity and the 
interest of the state to get data in a criminal investigation, but also not to uh, um, put the service provider in a situation uh, that the company would uh, have to be uh, fined uh, by another jurisdiction. There are several uh, ways uh, one can discuss to do this. Uh, there is one possibility the European Commission has also included in its regulation. This is what we call the International Committee, so a sort of um, procedure between different states in order to find out uh, what are the interests of the different states and in the end what interest of let's say one of the two states would take uh, precedence over the other, which would mean either giving the data or not giving the data. Uh, in these cases, uh, from our point of view, it is certainly important uh, to make a distinction what could be the reasons that the service provider would not be allowed to give the data. There may be different reasons. One may be economic interests of the state, uh, but it may also be for data protection rules in that given jurisdiction or for the respect of fundamental rights. Let's take the example that a service provider would be asked to give uh, information on a person that is under suspicion and if the suspicion could in the end lead to a death penalty, what would we do in the European Union? Would we give the data or would we not give the data because death penalty is forbidden in the European Union under the Charter of Fundamental Rights? Uh, for these uh, cases, uh, mechanisms, procedures have to be found and in the end uh, also the, let's say, um, the, the values that have to be protected have to be weighted against each other. Maybe one last sentence because I'm thinking I'm already, but it's very difficult to put this all in eight minutes. Um, but uh, maybe to wrap up my, my first intervention is that of course uh, one possibility to uh, better address this conflict of law situations uh, would be uh, an agreement, would be an international agreement, uh, because simply in this text, in this international agreement, you cannot put all the obligations, the possibilities between uh, two jurisdictions, and this would prevent to always in each and every investigation, one would have to ask the question, uh, is there a clash of jurisdictions? Can we give the data? Can we not give the data? Uh, this is why we have uh, recently started, and we are at the very beginning, in negotiations with the United States of America and the European Commission that uh, negotiates on behalf of the European Union to find out whether we could come finally to an agreement that would uh, so to say, address the situation of conflicts of uh, jurisdictions to look in the safeguards we have in both jurisdictions and this is certainly not easy but also not impossible to find common ground in the end to address all the situations in order to still get the data in time for criminal investigations to uh, respect the, uh, the rights of the suspect. This is not a convicted person, but still a person under suspicion. And last but not least, also to make sure that the service provider in the end is not faced with an impossible situation. Uh, so these are, I would say, the three main elements that would have to be uh, go into uh, this agreement why uh, EU and the US. I think the answer is quite simple because most of the the companies who have the data are subject to U.S. jurisdictions, and for the U.S. it is certainly also true that, of course, the European Union uh, is an area where there are often contacts also when it comes to criminal investigations, so uh, the cooperation between EU authorities is also very important for the United States. I maybe stop here. I hope I have not overloaded you with a lot of information, but I think once we get in the discussion thing, will also hopefully become a little bit clearer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming, and, and thanks for the organizers. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so we've heard about some of the challenges with respect to cross-border access to data. I'm going to spend a f my time, a few minutes, talking about um, some of the relatively recent, now about a year and a half, old changes in US law that were designed to 
address this problem. Um, probably most of you here, if not all of you, have heard of what's known as the Cloud Act. Um, and this was a law that was passed in May of 2018 in the United States. Um, and um, it's been fairly controversial, particularly outside the United States, although, as I'll try to explain, I think some of the controversy is based on a bit of misunderstanding about what this law is and how it actually operates. Um, so the law itself um, was the culmination of two very interconnected but distinct kind of initiatives, um, trends that were happening in the United States. So on the one hand, for, for several years before the passage of the Cloud Act, several foreign governments, including most notably the UK, um, were putting, um, raising in, in a range of diplomatic meetings and public statements concerns about exactly the problems that have just been raised, about the fact that often in local investigations involving local perpetrators, local witnesses, local victims, evidence that criminal investigators sought happen to be located outside of the investigating state's borders and often in the hands of US-based service providers. Um, and this posed a number of problems um, for local law enforcement, in particular um, when local law enforcement was seeking content information, meaning beyond meaning actually the, the subs, the content of what's included in, for example, an iMessage or an email, um, then U.S. law prohibits U.S.-based companies from turning that data over to foreign governments, even if the foreign government has satisfied all of its local procedural rules and substantive rules and is seeking data again for a local investigation. Um, and so, as I said, foreign governments were and, and are remain quite frustrated about this, and we're putting a lot of pressure on the United States to facilitate access for these kinds of local criminal investigations. What would happen instead is that the foreign government has to use what's known as the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty Process, which means the foreign government makes a diplomatic request to the US government. The US government then reviews that request um, and essentially applies US law and US standards, which means sending the request down to a US attorney who then goes to a US court with a US warrant according to the US standard of probable cause. Eventually, if the evidence is responsive, it goes back to the US attorney, back up to the US government, the Department of Justice, and back to the requesting state. As, as one can imagine, this is a fairly time-consuming process. According to a now, um, I believe, three or four-year-old report, this took an average of 10 months. You can imagine that that time period has only increased over time as the volume of requests has increased as well. And in addition to being time-consuming, it also raises a range of normative questions about why foreign governments should necessarily have to use US processes and US standards in order to access data regarding their own citizens or their own nationals in the investigation of local crime. So one part of the Cloud Act seeks to address that. It authorizes the US government to enter into executive agreements with foreign governments, and pursuant to those executive agreements, foreign governments could, instead of going through this mutual legal assistance process, make direct requests to US-based providers for content. Now, these agreements are subject, per US law, to a number of different criteria. Um, number one, and most importantly, foreign governments can only make requests for people who are not in the United States, who are not US citizens. So it's an attempt to, to basically create this, this concept that US law should govern access to US citizens' data, US residents' data, but US law d doesn't necessarily need to apply to foreign government requests for data that doesn't involve those over whom the US has an arguable sovereign interest. Um, secondly, all of the requests need to meet a number of different standards. First, in order to even enter into an executive agreement, the country itself has to be certified 
by the Attorney General and the Secretary of State as being human rights and rule of law compliant. And then each of the individual requests have to meet a number of different criteria. They have to be reviewed by some or, or overseen by some sort of independent authority. They have to be based on credible and articulable facts. They have to be particularized. There's a, there's a number of limitations that apply in terms of how the data that's then transferred is used, requirements about secure storage, and a host of other requirements. Um, so that's part one of the Cloud Act. It was an attempt to, as I said, deal with foreign government's concerns. Um, the Cloud Act was passed in, I said, May 2018. The very first agreement, draft agreement, has been put forward between the US and the UK just last month. Um, and then there's another 180 day or six month waiting period before that agreement can go into effect. Um, the US has announced that there are negotiations with Australia for another such agreement. And there's been some discussions about whether or not a U US EU agreement would be possible. Um, again, this is a partial solution to deal with concerns of particular governments. As you can see, it's a slow and laborious process. This law has now been in place for a year and a half, and we just have the very first draft agreement. So it's not going to solve the full range of issues that have been presented, but it's one attempt from the US side to address some of the particular problems being expressed by foreign governments. The other piece of the Cloud Act um, was a direct response to a lawsuit um, that was brought by Microsoft in which the US government had, via a warrant, um, sought data that it asserted was needed in one of its own criminal cases. And it turned out that that data, and they sought that data from Microsoft, it turned out that that data was stored on a server outside the United States in Ireland. Microsoft said, um, that they would not turn over the data because the US's warrant jurisdiction did not apply extraterritorially. And the US government fought back and said, I think um, rightly so, that at least historically, um, when the US had served compelled disclosure orders on US-based companies, um, it was presumed that those disclosure orders applied to data within the possession, custody, and control of those providers without regard to location. This case um, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Before the US Supreme Court could rule, the US Congress stepped in and basically clarified um, what, as I said, had been longstanding practice, that US compelled disclosure orders require US-based companies to turn over data within their possession, custody, or control without regard to the location of where that data happens to be. That said, the US Congress also, consistent with this idea that um, governments have a legitimate interest in dictating um, access to data regarding their own citizens and their own nationals, um, put in this law a new provision, which is called a comedy-based provision, which basically says that in certain circumstances, um, if the US government is seeking data from a US-based company, and if certain preconditions are in place, and it's seeking data of a foreigner outside the, juris outside the territorial boundaries of the United States, and that request, request rec creates a conflict of law, providers can go and complain and, and raise the concern that there's a conflict of law um, based on the fact that there's another sovereign interest with a legitimate interest in controlling and setting the rules governing access to that data. Again, based on the idea that there's a sovereign interest in controlling and setting the rules with regard to access to data of one's own citizens and one, one's own residents, but the sovereign interest is increasingly, for some of the reasons that have been already stated, delinked from where the zeros and ones happen to be located. Um, the same law also um, made clear that um, other provisions in kind of common law provisions in US law could also apply and that providers could make similar um, claims about conflict of laws in those situations as well. Now, interestingly, um, as far as I know, there have been no such claims brought before the courts. Um, that doesn't mean that those won't arise in the future, and they may arise in particular in relation to um, particular restrictions that are in the EU's GDPR that place limitations on the sharing of data back to the United States. 
So I will end there. There may be lots of questions about how the Cloud Act operates. I'm happy to talk about them and to, and to clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Um, I would like to say a few words about the role of the data protection authorities and the European Data Protection Board in this context. So the um, DPAs are competent to supervise uh, the law enforcement authorities when they request data in third countries. And um, they are also competent to supervise the providers when considering whether to respond to such uh, requests um, for data by a law enforcement authority. So we have to, to look to both sides. Um, as this is a matter of uh, European Union law, um, the DPIs are committed to work together on the, on the interpretation of the GDPR and the e-evidence proposal. Uh, and the forum to work together is the EDPB. Um, I would therefore not surprise anybody that the um, EDPB uh, has issued an opinion on the e evidence proposal and a letter to the uh, competent um, committee of the European Parliament uh, on the implications um, of the US Cloud Act for the EU data protection framework. Uh, we have also on our agenda for 2020 um, a further guidance on the interpretation of the uh, much discussed Article 48 of the GDPR. Um, before I turn to the question how the conflicts should be addressed and uh, how they can be resolved, I would like to make a comment on the nature of the conflicts. Um, I do not really like uh, the term of blocking statutes, um, which is often used in this context. Uh, of course, data protection laws uh, may, in effect, not allow the disclosure or transfer into, um, to a law enforcement authority of a third country, but the purpose of that blocking is not a politically motivated um, kind of protectionism, um, but the protection of fundamental rights um, enshrined in the European Union Charter. Um, there is no legal base of, of times um, for such a requested transfer. Uh, on the Cloud Act and the e-evidence proposal, I should also say that I understand the need for faster access to data and um, that um, data protection law do not stand in the way to find solutions to make such faster access uh, possible. Um, but one of our main concerns is that the Cloud Act, as well as the e-evidence proposal, as suggested by the uh, Commission, take the authorities um, in the country of the provider out of the picture. And we are concerned that the decision whether to object to a request is entirely put in the hands of the requested provider as a private company. Um, don't get me wrong, um, I'm not suggesting that providers will always be wrong or cannot be trusted. The Microsoft case is a good example of a company challenging the position of its government, but it's also correct that companies have different considerations to make and different obligation than public authorities. Um, in my view, it should neither be the aim to avoid um, judicial assistance nor to await the objections are, uh, that uh, objections arise. That does not make the conflict of laws uh, vanish. A better way to deal with the cross-border situations would, in, uh, in my view, to involve the authority of the member state where the provider, the European Union member state, where the provider is requested from the very beginning. I thus welcome that the rapporteur in the European Parliament has recently suggested to introduce a notification of an authority in the country of the requested provider. And I also understand that a similar provision may be included in the important protocol to cybercrime, which is also currently uh, under debate. The aim of our discussion should be thus uh, not to be how to deblock data and pave the way for unhindered access to data in uh, other jurisdictions. Um, the aim should rather to ensure the possibility of swift and efficient access to data abroad while ensuring a high level of data protection in the European Union, but also elsewhere. Um, from our perspective, the most promising way forward to resolve the conflicts are bilateral agreements, in particular with the US, where the main providers sit, as well as a new generation of amlets, as the EDPB calls them, allowing for faster access and including more data protection safeguards. 
These agreements would ideally establish two things. They could set deadlines for faster access to data while shaping an international standards uh, for data protection. We will insist, however, on the second aspect as DPAs. Um, too often we have seen that agreements on law enforcement authority powers do not regulate what the harmonized standard of data protection is. I recognize that it's not realistic that the UA, uh, EU will make agreements with the rest of the world shortly. So um, committee uh, clauses will thus be important too. In this context, I would like to make two comments. First, from the EU perspective, uh, it's rather unclear what kind of committee US courts will apply as long as there is no executive agreement in place. And second, I would like to recall that the Council, the European Union Council, in its general approach on the e-evidence proposal, has suggested to delete uh, a mechanism to solve possible conflicts. Um, such mechanism um, includes the consultation of the authority of a third country in a case of conflict of laws, and even the obligatory lifting of the order if the authority in the third country confirms the conflict. Um, such mechanism point in the right direction should not be deleted. Um, finally, I have not spoken much about the data subject, as we call it in the GDPR yet, um, but about the relationship between the authorities and the providers. Um, on this if, um, aspect, the EDPB has always stressed the need for notification requirements for the data subject in order to enable these citizens to challenge the legality um, for the request before a court. This is an important issue for the negotiations of the bilateral agreement uh, and the negotiations of the Cybercrime Convention. In a nutshell, this would be our preferred approach on how to deal with conflicts and um, how to resolve them. Such conflicts are likely to be there for some time still. Thank you. Sophia. Um, well, first, thank you very much for organizing this panel. As you can see, this is not an, e not an easy topic to talk about. Um, I'm honored to be sharing this space with all of you. Um, I'm the legal advisor to a UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, David Kay. He's an independent expert and I work with, with him. And we work out of the University of California. So we are, we're, we are independent from the UN, so my comments are more on a personal basis. And with my intervention, as Nicolas um, mentioned, I will try to provide like a complementary view to this discussion to add a little bit and draw upon some of the comments that they've made on human rights. I believe that um, the language, the vocabulary of human rights, its framework, its vision can provide a basis for restraining the worst intrusions, the worst violations in the digital wor world. And at the same time, it can promote the best ways to do so. I think Human rights can do this, I think, and not in a vague, airy, fairy way that some people think human rights are, and that's possibly this is not something uh, that Europeans think about human rights, but this is this happens around the world. Um, but in but I mean it in in the context of its legal provisions, the rights and that it guarantees and recognizes to people, but most importantly the mechanism that it creates, because law just in a paper, in, in an agreement, without an enforcement mechanism to bring human rights to the people, it's, well, it's useless for most of them. So this is definitely the human rights law or framework is definitely not a guarantee for success. <laughs> I mean, human rights have all sorts of problems, and you might hear other panels talk about that and some other issues with regards to normative development, enforcement, and other issues. But it is a global, global set of, uh, of norms and obligations on states and set of universal rights that can provide and can work on these issues and can provide some sort of uh, view on what to do next and how to fill some of the gaps that there might be. Um, as you might, like, I apologize for the human rights uh, advocates here or for those who, are, who work in human rights. I might be saying things that are obvious for you, but I believe there's a broader audience that we can, 
that we can talk to. Um, as maybe you all know, or some of you know, the human, human rights law does, as a general matter, not, do not directly govern the activities and responsibilities of businesses, or it doesn't impose any direct legal obligation on businesses. However, the actions of those businesses and or those companies do affect human rights and, do, and can have impacts, whether positive or negative, on the enjoyment of those rights. A variety of initiatives within the UN uh, have provided some guidance on how these companies can, can comply with fundamental right, rights. These are, uh, some of you might know, the Human Rights Council endorsed the guiding principles in business and human rights. And this specific initiative recognizes that businesses, enterprises, have a responsibility to respect human rights. It's like, it's a three pillar framework where it says that states have obligation to protect the rights, companies responsibility to respect, and there's a pillar on remedies. And this part of the remedies might be some of the issues on this conversation that might be convoluted or might be not so easy to understand, but victims need to know where they can file a claim, where they can uh, seek remedy for a human rights violation, and that might also be very difficult when there is no clear norm on how to do it. Uh, so human rights, besides being uh, like in, inherent to all human we beings, whatever their race, their place of residence, sex, ethnic, uh, um, ethnic origin, color, religion, and other status, they also have specific guarantees on the laws and that on, on the law specific oblig binding obligation to states and any agreement that states make within each other have to abide by those international human rights norms. You have, at the universal level, you have the ICCPR, the International Covenant, Covenant for Civil and Political Rights or the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. You have those set of frameworks that states, states have obligations and there are specific rules that they have to follow whenever they do this agreement, whenever they make these agreements. So in a more substantive, and, and this is where I, I'll make a point very quickly, <laughs> uh, some of the substantive rights that, might, that I think we should be thinking when we're analyzing the situations are basically two, freedom of expression and privacy. They are usually the ones that get violated or are violated when this sharing of information happens. Uh, privacy uh, guarantees that everyone, that they won't be subject to unlawful or arbitrary interference with their privacy. Again, this requires interpretation, development. Some of our panelists can provide some, maybe more, more information of this, on this, but there, it says at the universal level, at the UN, it, there is set, a set of standards and mechanisms to understand what this protection might mean. On freedom of expression, we have one specific provision, that's where I work mostly on, that's Article 19 of the ICCPR, and it's the, it refers to everyone's rights to seek, receive, and impart information, and ideas of all kinds. And it also includes a great provision that David Kay and Agnes Calamar are an expert on this, on this subject. They say that when the ICCPR was first envisioned, they were, they were basically ahead of its time because it included a specific provision that says, regardless of frontier, this protection is regardless of frontier and through any media. So again, we can draw from human rights standards to answer some of these questions. And this is a robust protection. And like, privacy and, and freedom of expression are intertwined, as you know, as most of you know, intertwined in the digital age, with online privacy serving as a gateway to secure the exercise of freedom of expression. And those specific people, specific persons who are target of surveillance, suffer that interference, interference with their rights to privacy and freedom of expression, whether the effort to monitor those communications is effective or not. The target does not, the target need have no knowledge 
of, of the attempted or successful intrusion or in their interference for there to be a violation of their, of their rights. However it, is, however, it is critical to see that um, such interference is a part of an overall effort to impose consequences on the target, like that's, that should be the aim. If this surveillance is conducted for unlawful purposes, the attempts at surveillance and the successful operation of it may be used in an effort to silence dissent, sanction criticism, or even punish independent reporting or their sources. So these are, might be some things to think about whenever these agreements are being held. And, well, I might be just giving you a lot of information, but these are mostly the substantial rights that I believe are critical for this discussion. But there's also, within international law, one thing that I believe uh, we sh when we think about how to move from human rights at the substantial level to uh, the actual specific level, level of making them work, there are a set of like procedural norms that as lawyers we most of us like <laughs> to think about procedural norms and this specifically what I'm going to talk about is something that is included in the provision of freedom of expression but it's also whenever you're analyzing any restrictions to human rights and these are that whenever I don't know if we have a lot of time but whenever there's a limitation to uh, freedom of expression or, on a right the states have the obligation to meet three conditions. This is very well grounded in European uh, human rights law in the inter-American system at the universal level. There are three conditions or a three-part test. The test of legality, that it, these restrictions have to seek to uh, protect their legitimate aim and these restrictions must be necessary and proportionate. From the legality standpoint, um, the restriction has to be part of a pre-existing set of laws. We all know that. Uh, it has to be clear and precise enough that doesn't give any government its excessive restriction. And it has to be formulated with a like sufficient precision to enable an individual to regulate his or her or their conduct, right? Um, this part might also be very difficult when the set of norms are not clear, the legality aspect of any restriction, when there is no clear framework on how to operate and how to model their behavior. Um, it must provide sufficient guidance to those who are in charge of the executions of this restriction so they, are, they can ascertain what sort of expressions are or sort of rights are how to properly restrict them so these provisions cannot be vague. That's a very important part of it. And any cross-border request that limits the right to privacy must conform to the law of the country making that request. Uh, the legitimate aim, you must also know this, the restriction must seek to protect the rights and reputation of others, national security or public order. And it must be necessary and proportionate, and this is key for the topic that we are analyzing. The restrictions must be limited to those which are strictly and demonstrably necessary to achieve that legitimate aim. Communication surveillance, for example, must only be conducted when it with only means of achieving that legitimate aim or when there are, whenever there are multiple means of, to do that. It is the least intrusive way to infringe of human rights. Any decision across border request must consider that the sensitivity of the information that they are accessing and the severity of the infringement on human rights, another competing interest. This is necessary in when, whenever these agreements are implemented, it is necessary to take it into account. And this necessity and proportionality standards give us advocates uh, or human rights advocates, the ability to demand government, and sometimes companies can help us do that, maybe in some of the cases that have been mentioned. Not only that they meet these standards, but we are seeking governments for them to actually demonstrate that they're doing whatever is necessary to uphold these international standards. Um, I'll leave it that way, and I will kind of, I can talk about other ways that I think 
drawing from international standards, we can continue to talk about how to resolve this conflict of loss, but this is like a general overview. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. Okay, so it's now up to you. Is there any, any question or any remark from your side? Anybody wishing to comment? Yes, please. There's a microphone in, over here. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Seger from Council of Europe. Uh, I'm dealing with cybercrime, including the second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime that was mentioned before. If I look at the EU evidence proposed regulation and directive, if I look at the Cloud Act and also the particular case that was referred to the Microsoft Ireland a case, and if we discuss the protocol to the Budapest Convention, it's clear we are talking about specific criminal investigations, right? The evidence is needed before court, and where the evidence can be challenged in court, right? We are not talking about mass surveillance. We are not talking about activities of national security bodies. We are not talking about bulk collection of data. We are talking about specific criminal investigation where specific data is needed. Now, we had last week a conference in Strasbourg and Geneva was there. Uh, and the question comes up, came up, if we have less than 0.01% of cybercrime cases leading to, with, to a criminal justice outcome, let's say a conviction or whatever, a, a court decision, can we then talk about rule of law? Can we say that governments meet the obligations also to protect individuals against crime? Let's face it, that's what we're talking about. Less than 0.01% of cyber crimes end up with a court decision. So, but that's the context. That's what all these proposals are aimed at, to come up with more efficient solutions. And I know data protection people, civil society said, oh, we should not give up all the rights because of efficiency. But efficiency is the problem here. And one of the key challenges is the problem of territoriality, the territorial limitations of criminal justice authorities. Um, yes, we have to make mutual legal assistance more efficient. And there are many ways of doing it, and also in connection with the protocol to the Budapest Convention, some of these proposals were discussed last week in, in Strasbourg. Just some text is available. But how could, for example, United States, that, already now, that now has difficulties to respond to 25,000 MLA requests in criminal matters per year, how could they deal with another 500,000 MLA requests per year at least? Because that's what we're talking about. US service providers have for the last 10 years, last 14 years, every year received hundreds of thousands of requests for subscriber information directly. And the proposals that we are discussing there on the table is to finally create a clearer legal basis for that type of practice. There's a lot of debate in Germany about Facebook and hate crime. Where Facebook should cooperate, they have to take down content and so on. I have not seen a proposal in Germany also to say Germany should send mutual legal assistance requests to the US in that respect. You're saying Facebook is offering a service here in Germany and therefore Facebook has to comply with the local laws. But what about European providers offering services elsewhere? There all the other rules come in. Data protection and you should send MLA, we have to be notified and so on. So we have to keep all of this, all of this in mind. Yes, we have to put safeguards in. I believe the proposals that are currently on the table do have safeguards built in. Notification is one of them. Yes, European states, in particular EU member states, may want to be notified if foreign law enforcement requests data from a, from a European service provider. But you cannot request that from everybody. The US government said last week, we cannot, we would not be able, we would be flooded with notifications. We don't want to be notified. So Europeans, because of European data protection rules, want to be notified. Others may not want to be notified. So I think we have to find solutions that are adaptable to the requirements of different states. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. So thanks. Um, just a few quick comments. So I think, I think the point that 
Um, we are talking about criminal law enforcement and, and not intelligence authorities is, a, is an incredibly important one. Um, secondly, I, would, I also would like to echo something that Mr. Kelber said as well, which is that there really are they're mutually um, compatible goals, which is efficient access and the implementation and um, promotion of meaningful civil liberties and privacy protections. And those two things have to go hand in hand um, at, for, for a whole host of, of reasons, which we can talk about in a moment. I do think that the whether or not one agrees with the very specifics of, in terms of the requirements that are included in the Cloud Act in terms of the kinds of standards that need to be met when making requests. Um, I do think that that is the kind of model that we should look at going forward in terms of trying to articulate very specific rules in terms of what is required and that provides a, an opportunity to do some leveling up as opposed to leveling down in terms of civil liberties and privacy protections. And then finally, on, on the question of notification Notification. I think to the extent that we're starting to talk about notification requirements of third parties, it's very important that the notification requirements are matched up with the sovereign interests at stake. And so to the extent that we're doing notification based on where the provider is located, the, the host state may have no real interest in the investigation or any of the targets of the investigation other than the fact that the data or the provider happens to be held there. And if we're going to do notification, whether voluntary or mandatory, I think it's the notification should be to the host state of the target of the investigation, the host state of the data subject whose data is being investigated. So if the UK is seeking data of a French person in France, then it makes sense to notify Potentially, it makes sense to notify France. It does not necessarily make sense to notify Ireland if the, the, the provider is located in Ireland or if the data is located in Ireland. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, and also for, for, for your statement. I mean, indeed, you made an important point. We are speaking about specific criminal investigations, so it's not about uh, prevention, it's not about, let's say, phishing exercises, it's also, and I think this is also important to say, not about cooperation between intelligence services. I see a bit something in the agreement between the US and the UK about <laughs> uh, this aspect, but it's not what we intend to do at, at European Union level. I mean, for, for us, the real challenge is indeed how to make these procedures more efficient because they are not efficient as they are for the time being. Um, but on the other hand, not to go completely away with fundamental rights, and I think nobody wants that. Uh, and then the question is indeed, what is the right balance? I mean, you can, of course, uh, criticize the Commission proposal and saying, uh, the Commission has completely left out the state where in the end the data is provided, uh, the state, or the, the enforcement state, so to say, which is not completely true because in the end, if the law, uh, service providers would not give the data, then the state where the law uh, service provider is located would come into play. But indeed, at the first uh, phase, uh, the proposal is to put all the necessary uh, assessment, examination of uh, all the fundamental rights issues to the issuing state. This has much to do uh, with n how do we trust each other in the European Union? Do you trust a member state who is part of the European Union to uh, to do this uh, right? And the other question is, and, and there in, I think indeed we can discuss this, uh, is the state where the enforcement, where the service provider would have to give the information is should the state have uh, an information that this is happening? This is a bit where the council goes in the direction, or is there still a possibility to veto, but then keep this efficient? I mean, I must say I see really a bit practical problems. We, we have said we want to have this information in 10 days. You can discuss whether 10 days is too short, too long, whatever, but it should certainly not be 100 days, and it should certainly be not a year. And if one would go for 10 days, the question in the end we have to settle is what kind of elements you can do in these 10 days that it still makes it a procedure that in the end deserves to say, okay, we, we are fine that, that all the safeguards have been, have been respected. So this, in my view, is a, 
is is the challenge we also have now as uh, legislators and to to find a, a common ground um, to balance efficiency with fundamental rights. Super. Thank you, Mr. Kleber. Thank you. Um, three points. First, to the uh, Facebook um, example. Before I've been elected as uh, Data Protection Commissioner, I was Parliamentary and State Secretary in the Ministry of Justice for more f than four years. I was one of the persons behind the network enforcement uh, law. And uh, there is no difference between my positions then and now. Um, because the idea behind uh, the network enforcement were providers to act as they've been asked for for more than 10 years now for deleting illegal content on the networks. What is discussed now in Germany about um, hate crime and um, platforms is to just open who is behind that, so, so a name, not about metadata or the content data. Um, this is just outside that idea. Um, ter uh, territorial, territoriality um, question. Um, I think that is um, important because um, there are a number of questions um, connected with that. One is, is a thing where the inspection is all about is illegal in both states? That's important inside the European Union because you can move freely um, between all the member states. It's even more um, interesting um, in uh, cooperation with the US and with the Budapest um, uh, Protocol, with all those countries behind that, it's even more um, important because there's sometimes a different understanding about some basic principles in law among those uh, countries. Last point, efficiency. Um, I've stated out that there has to be more efficiency because uh, the older, uh, old ideas of Amlets has been run out of time, but there are alternatives to just take away all the safeguards. You can set deadlines for the reaction of the national authorities. Um, you can have safeguards even on the side of the uh, private companies. Um, and you have to solve a lot of problems uh, even on the technological side, like authentication. Who is that uh, behind that request? Is that uh, really uh, Sheriff Miller from uh, uh, XYZ County uh, in uh, Nebraska, or is that uh, another person? This is solved among um, authorities, public authorities in Europe, but with, uh, between and those uh, providers, but uh, it isn't solved with a um, sheerless huge number um, of um, such authorities and every private company in such a large economic market like uh, European Union and the US. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry we are in Germany and I need to fit into the cliche of Germany, which means that I need to end now because the, the time is over. I want to end uh, by saying explicitly thank you to Microsoft for making this possible, um, to you for uh, being here. I'm sure that there are more questions open now than we had at the beginning, but this is, in my view, an example of a good debate then, if, if, if the questions are more, not less, but on a higher level, hopefully. Um, thank you very much for being with us and have a nice day here in Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I'm sorry. I, 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 thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was excellent. Thank you. German speaking participants on that panel are not from regions which are known for the most. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think Brussels is but, but not that punctual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we are absolutely not. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Just you may know. Yeah. But I spent late in my part of Germany. Yeah. They were already outside. Yeah. Yeah. But the others are waiting already. Yeah. 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 So I spent 20 years of my career in Hanover, and that okay. was one no, of no, the no. perceptions. No, I mean, one of the perceptions was that everybody would be on time. They were just not true. So it was just me being on time, but the others are not. But not even in a number. Yeah, it's Germany absolutely, yeah. Western absolutely, yeah. No, but the next group is already waiting yeah. outside and therefore. Uh, thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you. For thank you so much, yeah. Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
mindestens einmal im Monat mit dem EPB und dann immer wieder mal noch Gerne. Ich muss Wie bitte? Uh, ja. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's law enforcement's completely out of the U.S. Okay. But there's no way.